happy to see everyone. And um, it's been a little bit of a while. I've been on vacation, which was fun, but I'm glad to be back to um, Neurology Morning Report. So did anyone bring a case they were hoping to present to us? And then of course we would need two people to discuss that case with me and the presenter, ideally one identifying as a woman and one identifying as a man. We have a small group today, so we need a higher proportion of people to participate. Three out of 11. Anyone um, had a neurology case they wanted to discuss or present? And was anyone hoping to discuss a case today, or maybe not hoping to, but realizes the opportunity is here and would like to consider doing so? Rafa has a case, wonderful, fantastic Rafa. So we have a case, who would like to discuss a case with Rafa and myself? Yasmin is a veteran discussant. I think you've discussed three, four or five <laughs> neuro VMRs. Um, so happy to have you. Um, and who would like to discuss with Yasmin? Or if two people were just about to do it, Yasmin, I'm sure would be happy to have you um, discuss. No, okay. So who would like to discuss with Yasmin and myself and Rafa Alice? Fantastic, thank you for volunteering. All right, we did it at 9.06, which is a record for us getting all of our players in order here. Um, so, um, Maria, do you mind scribing and teaching points and things like that? Or are you busy over there? No, you don't have a full courtyard of waiting patients. You do, but <laughs> okay. Um, all right, um, Rafa, Yasmin, and Alice, would you like to introduce yourselves? And then we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, I guess I could start. Um, it's my first time, so I'm a bit nervous. Um, I live in Berlin. I study medicine here. I'm currently doing some research um, before I start my last year of medical school. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for joining us uh, from Berlin, Alice. Um, Rafa and Yasmin. Oh, uh, I guess it's my turn. So hello, everyone. I am Yasmin. I am an IMG, an international medical graduate from Mexico, currently living in San Antonio. I'm preparing to give my step, my first step in September. So yeah, here I am. Fantastic. And Rafa, I think you're a CP solver celebrity, but just in case for people who don't know you. <laughs> oh, right, I'm not a celebrity for sure. So uh, hi everyone, uh, such a pleasure to be here. Such a pleasure to have you back Aaron, with us. Um, looking forward to learning from all of you. Fantastic. So Alice, you said this is your um, first time here. I'm not sure if it, you mean first time discussing or first time here um, entirely, but for anyone who might be their first time um, here, we're going to um, have the case presented in little pieces at a time by Rafa. And then um, I'll ask you your thoughts and all thoughts are fair game. If you're not sure, you might not know, just take a attempt at saying what you might think. And then um, I might ask you some questions or we'll talk back and forth. It's very relaxed, casual. We try to learn some neurology, reduce our collective um, neurophobia and learn some things together from Rafa's case. Um, and if you have questions, of course, anyone has questions, feel free to, um, feel free to uh, ask me if something I say is not clear, you want me to elaborate on it, or you just had a step one practice question on that Yasmin and you wanna hear <laughs> um, the, uh, persp my perspective on it. Okay. Fantastic. So Rafa, why don't you give us just the chief concern and then we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, so this is a patient presenting with frequent falls. Frequent falls. Okay, so Alice, when you hear that a patient is presenting with frequent falls and that's all we know so far, what starts coming to mind for you? Okay, so, um, so many things basically. Um, one thing is ataxia. So um, that could be a reason why someone falls. Um, the other thing is 
I'm thinking about the um, autonomic nervous system as well. Um, so there's some atypical Parkinson's syndromes that can present with autonomic dysfunctions. So that could also be something I'm thinking about. And then frequent falls could also be that a person just can't see properly. properly. So maybe, yeah, visual, um, yeah, I don't know, something in the visual system. So yeah, that's just the first things that come to mind. Fantastic, excellent. And um, for those of you who've heard me discuss um, gait before, um, Alice is getting at many of the main points here. Right? When we do the neurologic exam, it has seven parts, right? <clears throat> Mental status, cranial nerves, motor, sensory reflexes, cerebellum, and gait. And why do we test gait at the end? Because gait, as I like to say, is sort of the symphony of all of the other instruments of the nervous system working together. Because as Alice said, uh, if you can't see very well, then it would be hard to walk without learning how to walk without seeing very well in assistive devices. So you need your vision. You probably need your cognition, right, to um, be aware of your environment when you're walking. Um, you need other subcortical structures like the basal ganglia um, that uh, pattern and select movements. As Alice said, in Parkinsonian syndromes, you could have trouble with walking. And then those are the sort of very higher level aspects of gait. But then we need our strength to move our legs. We need our sensation to feel where we are in space. And we need our coordination from the cerebellum to coordinate our gait movements, right? So when a patient presents with a gait disorder, we're examining all these components to ask ourselves, um, could this be a problem because the patient's legs are weak? Could this be a problem because the patient has some difficulty with proprioception? Is this patient ataxic? And sometimes all the elements of the elemental neurologic exam are normal. You don't find anything. And then you watch the patient walk and say, there is a characteristic problem with the way the patient is walking here. And even though all the individual parts are working together, the conductor of the orchestra, something going on in the brain cortically or subcortically um, is, is not working to coordinate those actions. And um, just observing the pattern of the gait can sometimes give us a clue to what type of problem is there. We'll get into that probably later. And then you made another important point, Alice, which is um, maybe these falls are not due to some mechanical problem, like you said, ataxia, weakness, Parkinsonism, et cetera. But what if there's autonomic dysfunction and these frequent falls are syncope, right? We didn't hear loss of consciousness, but that's, um, I was thinking frequent falls, I sort of activate my um, way of thinking about gait, but you make the uh, excellent point that this might not be the patient's gait at all. This could be um, this could be the patient passing out, right? And those could be the quote unquote falls. And then we'd be thinking more about our episodic loss of consciousness types of schemas. Um, excellent, those are all um, great thoughts. So um, now going into the history, right? We have some um, things we're interested in. So um, Yasmin, as we're about to hear the history and with this background of all the different reasons someone could fall, what types of questions are you um, thinking about um, as we hear this history that you're hoping that will be answered? Well, first of all, whenever I listen to frequent falls, I will think about an older patient uh, because it is known that patients that are older of 65 uh, years, uh, they get a higher risk of falls. I will also ask how many times as this has presented if they have reported two or more falls in the past, let's say three, six months, or if it's something that's not just like recent, because as Alice said, and as you already uh, mentioned, I will think I will evaluate first the fall risk and then syncope, if there is gait or mobility problems, vision impairment, any cognitive impairment, uh, if there is uh, postural hypertension, if there is any, uh, if, if our patient is uh, has polypharmacy, because sometimes use of uh, some drugs can alter, um, or a metabolic deficiency. I was reading about a vitamin D deficiency that will cause, uh, that will be a factor. But yeah, I will, I will rather listen to the next part of the aliquots to see what's up with our patient. Yeah, excellent, right? So, you know, when we hear these chief concerns, like I said, it's, it's helpful to activate this sort of very large um, playing field of different possibilities. And then when we are listening to the history, um, these will help us hopefully start narrowing things down so that when we get to the exam, we have specific hypotheses we want to test, right? So 
the one thing both Alice and Yasmin are saying is we want to understand what are the circumstances of these falls, right? Is the patient um, tripping? Are they losing consciousness? Um, are these falls mostly at night? So it might suggest a problem with vision or it might suggest a problem with proprioception, right? If it's dark, we're sort of doing a Rumberg test on the patient in real life, right? If they can't see and they're relying on their proprioception, are they falling in the shower? One of my mentors like to ask, because when you close your eyes to wash your hair, you're doing a Rumberg test on yourself, right? Can you maintain your balance? Of course, we'll want to know the patient's age, as Yasmin said, someone who's in their older age. Um, we might expect a few falls as um, uh, people slow down and have various um, uh, um, orthopedic problems and other multifactorial um, problems uh, leading to gait disorders, whereas if we heard frequent falls in a child or a young adult, might be thinking about this differently. So we're going to want to understand the context and then the types of questions I like to ask, like I said, are, you know, what are the circumstances of these falls, right? Are they during the day? Are they at night? Are they at home? Or are they mostly when the patient's outside and maybe less familiar uh, environment? Um, uh, and if the patient um, can articulate it, we can ask them, you know, are, do you feel that your legs are weak outside of walking, difficulty getting up from a chair, those sorts of things? Do you feel any numbness? Do you feel any pain? Do you feel any incoordination to try to start getting a sense of where um, the lesion or lesions uh, might be? Or are there, as Alice invoked, we hear if there's an older person with difficulty in their gait, obviously some type of Parkinsonian disorder starts bubbling up in our thoughts as a potential differential diagnosis. And we'd, so we'd want to ask about other potential features of Parkinsonism, rigidity, uh, tremor, et cetera. So those are some things um, that are sort of in, in the back of my mind as I start to hear the patient's uh, history and think about what questions I want to ask if those aren't um, revealed spontaneously in the history. So um, what did you find there, Rafa, in the, in the history? Okay, so bear with me because I'm going to be both typing and reading. <laughs> oh, okay. So so this is a 72 year old female with uh, frequent falls. This patient had uh, multiple falls over the past week. And now it's occurring multiple times per day. Um, the patient describes losing balance with um, usual daily activities, um, such as stepping backwards. This patient also refers that previously she was completely in the independent and also has, she has never fallen before. Uh, she denies uh, fevers, chills, chest pain, abdominal pain, and back pain. Um, on further review of the system, she reveals that she has this numbness and tingling that started on, on her fingers two months ago. Uh, progress to involve all fingers in both hands. And also, uh, she started about a week ago with numbness and tingling in the feet. And that's the end of the other quote. Excellent. Okay. Um, I think you started first last time, Alice. So Yasmin, um, you were wondering what would happen in the history. You have some more information on what's on your mind at this point. No, actually, actually, the first thing, every single time, maybe it's a step one preparation. Every single time I see this numbness of fingers and stuff, I would think uh, vitamin 12 deficiency. Um, but again, uh, first of all, she's recently losing balance. So I will think about uh, first, uh, maybe when we talk about examination, but I will do a Romberg test to see if there's a sensory ataxia or cerebral ataxia, or um, I will also be looking for um, this fever, chills and chest pain. I, uh, well, she denies it. So I don't think it would be a infection. Uh, I will, I, all this, all these signs are pointing more something metabolic, or but I would, I would rather do more examination. Yeah, yeah um, I'm we're definitely always... going to metabolic and asking which are the drugs she's taking because she's 72 and many people that are like elderly people have this uh, polypharma again polypharmacy again various criteria is nowhere to be seen. So I will ask for that. Yeah, excellent. So right, yeah, any chief concern in someone who's taking 
medications. Um, we want to make sure that, that that could not be somehow related to those um, medications. Um, uh, very good. So what, what to do with the uh, numbness in the fingers, progressing to the toes, um, and some of the other facts here. Did you have other thoughts here, um, Alice? Um, I'm also thinking about uh, neuropathy. Um, so this is like a um, glove and a socks kind of distribution. So I think first thing that comes to mind is diabetes. So if she's older, that's something I would like to check. Um, also, I would be interested if she's exposed to any toxins, so alcohol as well or other things. Maybe her, her job back when she was working. Um, yeah, I, was, uh, I would also be interested in vitamin 12 because that especially um, is important for proprioceptor, proprioception. Um, yeah, but I'm, I don't know, I find the stepping backwards part a bit particular. So I'm not sure what to make of that. Um, when reading it, for some reason, I think about neurodegenerative disease, but maybe that's not, yeah, I don't know. I would be interesting what uh, you think about that. Yeah, excellent point. So let's, let's, um dive into some of those. So yeah, when you hear about um, numbness, now we know the sensory system is involved. We haven't heard in particular about um, weakness. So we have some type of imbalance, some type of gait disorder, and some type of sensory um, disturbance here, right? So could this whole thing be explained by a sensory um, disorder? Well, as we said earlier, right, sensation is one of the key parts to walking normally because your feet have to feel where the ground is um, in space. And so um, if we were to be, try to be very parsimonious and say, is this whole thing a problem with the sensory um, pathways causing both the positive symptom of tingling and the negative symptoms of numbness and loss of proprioception, um, could that explain the whole picture? Um, so if we, if we consider that for now, that we have a problem in the sensory system, the question would be where along the sensory system are we and do we have any clues from the history and what clues will we need to look for in the exam to figure that out? So the somatosensory uh, systems, right, to review the neuroanatomy, right, are, are feeling, so all the sensory systems, right, are afferent. They're bringing information from the world back to the brain in contrast to the motor systems, which are bringing signals from the brain out to the world to move, to interact with the environment, right? So the somatosensory system in particular is taking sensations from the skin, from the deep uh, tendon organs, from the muscles, um, et cetera, and bringing that information back um, for processing in the brain. So, um, so what do we have here as far as the somatosensory system? So they begin in the peripheral nerves, right? And the peripheral nerves have their processes out in contact with these receptors, Golgi tendon organs and Piscinian corpuscles and all this stuff from the first year of medical school, right? And they're taking those signals back along the peripheral nerves um, to the dorsal root ganglia. And then remember that dorsal root ganglia, these sensory nerves are sort of these bipolar or pseudo unipolar neurons instead of one axon and a few dendrites, right? It's, it sort of has two axons or one axon and one very specialized dendrite. One of the axons is out in the periphery feeling what's going on. Then there's the dorsal root ganglia, which is the cell body. And then the other axon is the dorsal root, which is going into the dorsal spinal cord. And once it arrives in the dorsal spinal cord, um, the nervous system separates pain and temperature in one pathway from vibration and proprioception in another pathway. So the vibration and proprioception go up through the dorsal or posterior columns in the posterior spinal cord. They go all the way up to the lower medulla, synapse in the um, nucleus cuneatus and gracilis in the dorsolateral medulla. The fibrous exit is the internal arcuate fibers to become the medial lemniscus, uh, which is crossed. That's where the crossing is in the lower medulla. And then those fibers continue contralaterally from their side of origin up the dorsal brainstem to the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus and up to the somatosensory cortex, which is the most anterior gyrus of the parietal lobes, right? Now the pain and temperature pathways take a similar, pain and temperature information uh, takes a similar path, but um, with, a, with an important difference. So the pain and temperature pathways also come in through the dorsal roots and then they have a synapse in the dorsal horn and the second order neurons cross right there upon entry in the spinal cord, technically over a few levels, but for clinical purposes, essentially right after entering the spinal cord. And they cross in the anterior white commissure of the spinal cord and arrive in the anterolateral portion of the spinal cord, why they're called the anterolateral or spinothalamic tracts. And so they've already crossed, they've already done their important crossing and they just continue all the way up until they end up um, uh, 
eventually by the level of the ponds uh, running adjacent with the medial lemnisci that we just discussed. And those also go to VPL of the thalamus and then to the somatosensory um, cortex. So the three long tracks, the corticospinal tracks, which we've discussed before, motor pathways on the way down, those cross at the cervical medullary junction. The dorsal columns cross just superior to that, but um, for clinical purposes, essentially very similar location in the lower medulla. And the spinothalamic tracks are the odd ones out, the pain and temperature pathways, those cross essentially immediately upon um, entering the spinal cord, meaning that central pain and temperature um, deficits are, are always contralateral, whereas motor and dorsal column uh, uh, deficits are contralateral if they're in the brain or brainstem, but ipsilateral if they're in the spinal cord or below. So with all that said, right, if this is a pure sensory problem, that means the patient could have a problem in the nerves and the dorsal root ganglia and the nerve roots and the spinal cord and the brainstem or in the brain. So are there any clues here in the history um, that help us figure out where along the pathway this must be? Now, there may be more than a sensory um, problem here, we don't know, but um, both of you were interested in neuropathy um, based on um, numbness in the fingers and um, numbness in the feet. And I think that's um, an important possibility. So what led you, either um, Yasmin or Alice, led you to think about peripheral neuropathy here as a potential cause of the patient's symptoms? Um, if I remember correctly, um, those are like the longest nerves in the body come to the fingers and to the toes. So they are exposed the longest. So they get affected easily when exposed to toxins or high glucose, for example. Um, so that's why I think it's the nerve um, who are affected. Because otherwise you have to have multiple locations to get this pattern. Yeah, yeah. E excellent. So, right, we have numbness in the fingers. Rafa hasn't told us specifically, but implied that it's both um, hands. No, you have told us both hands. I see it typed there, perfect. So it's in both hands then it's in both feet. So this is the stocking glove um, pattern that Alice mentioned, right? And so imagine you would have to have two small lesions each on both sides to get just the hand cortical areas and just the feet cortical area. It doesn't make sense, right? There's a lot of stuff um, be between them. Um, and then in the brainstem, you have no cranial nerve deficits, right? right? So, so it seems unlikely. And then we get to the spinal cord also. And if we had a spinal cord problem, right? Why would we just affect the distal extremities and not the more proximal extremities? Why is there no bowel or bladder? So then we start getting out to nerve roots um, and to nerves, right? This can't be neuromuscular junction or, or muscle, right? That doesn't cause sen sensory problems that cause motor problems. So we're somewhere in the roots or nerves and most processes that affect the nerve roots and all are painful, right? The patients have radicular symptom shooting, lancinating, um, electrical neuropathic type pain, and we don't, we don't hear that. So when we have this symmetric distal predominant um, sensory problems or motor problems or both. Um, this does strongly suggest a peripheral neuropathy, a polyneuropathy, right? And we can even um, uh, dissect this history a little bit further. Um, Rafa told us importantly that the problem began in the hands and then progressed um, to the feet. So if you think of your patients, so uh, uh, both Alice and Yasmin have mentioned diabetes and diabetic neuropathy. Diabetes, um, certainly the most common cause of peripheral polyneuropathy in high-income countries. I believe leprosy may still be the um, uh, most prominent cause in lower-income countries, but diabetes may have taken over there um, as well. Um, but um, think of all your patients with diabetic neuropathy. Um, do they usually have problems in the feet, at, uh, problems in the hands at first presentation or? Well, from what I've seen on diabetic P, uh, patients, their sensory deficits, they are distal and symmetric, yes, but they also uh, talk about this uh, burning fit syndrome. They also complain a lot about their, their feet also being involved. I don't know if this patient also has feet involvement. And uh, normally, well, the times I've seen it, um, I haven't checked that yet. If when they come with this uh, issue, the proprioception, uh, this polyneuropathies, they also come to you not exactly because of the polyneuropathy, but because you already developed an ulcer. And that's when we find out in the examination, like, oh, apparently, like this has been long, uh, uh, long evolution. 
you're coming here for the ulcer, but in reality it's because you already had developed uh, polyneuropathy, like in, especially in feet. Yeah, that's, that's right. Were you gonna add something, um, Alice, or? Um, actually, I'm not sure, but I think there was, I think I read about it that sometimes it can start symmetrically in the hands rather than the feet, but I'm not, I think, is that, has that to do with axonal, axonal versus demyelinating? Yeah, yes, you know what you're, I mean? you're getting to the next point. Do you want to try to explain that a little bit more or I can explain it um, if you like? No, I think I'd rather uh, <laughs> okay. need you explain it. I'm not yeah. sure. I just have I, something. In my yep, mind. you have the right something there. And so let's see if we can, um, we can do that. So I see the chat is blowing up with a lot of etiologies and um, the differential diagnosis of a peripheral polyneuropathy is very extensive, right? It's, you know, diabetes is one through 10, right? But as people are saying, there are other, B12 has been mentioned, um, drug-induced neuropathies, infectious neuropathies, genetic neuropathies like Charcot-Marie Tooth, um, uh, immune-mediated neuropathies like Guillain-Barre and CIDP, paraprotein-associated neuropathies, infectious neuropathies, HIV neuropathy, leprosy neuropathy. Um, there are, is a huge list. So how do we start to break that down? And it has to do with what Alice said. So um, the reason I asked about diabetes is because we've all seen cases of diabetic neuropathy. And if you think about these cases, the patients are often, if they come in early, telling you about problems in their feet, right? Numbness, tingling, pain, um, weakness, the ulcers are in the feet from loss of sensation and um, not noticing the um, injuries they're getting, as, as Yasmin said. So um, why are they beginning in the feet? And if the patient does have diabetic neuropathy and they're telling you that the hands are affected as well, generally on the history, you'll find that the feet were affected long before the hands. And we're seeing the opposite pattern here, which is important. So this gets at this important distinction that Alice mentioned, which is axonal versus demyelinating neuropathy. So that neuropathies can be categorized in many different ways. Are they motor, sensory, or sensory motor, or autonomic, or mixed? Um, are they, they can be classified by etiology. But one of the, I think the most important um, distinction in, in moving further with a differential diagnosis is this axonal versus demyelinating pathophysiology, and we'll, we'll see why. So when you have um, axons, right? The, when you have an axonal process, the longest axons are affected first. Um, and what is the reason for that? Well, if you think about those poor axons that have to get from the lumbar spine all the way to the tips of the toes, right? These really long axons, if there's some toxin, some metabolite um, affecting axonal transport, the longest um, axons are going to be the most vulnerable to that. Whereas a short axon that just has to get from your spine to your neck muscles, right? It's like if you have a traffic jam, but your commute is only one mile, shouldn't be too bad. If you have a traffic jam and your commute is 20 miles, right, it's going to be worse. The clearest example of this, um, where it makes the most sense, at least to me, is um, taxanes, platins, um, these uh, uh, vincristine, vinblastine, these chemotherapies function by inhibiting microtubules, right? So they prevent rapidly dividing cancer cells from organizing their mitotic spindles and dividing. But remember from first year of medical school that those axons, how do they get stuff from the nucleus all the way down to the axon terminal? Well, these microtubule conveyor belts, what was it? Seven by two, remember all this stuff? I don't, I don't remember anymore. Yasmin might know from step one, seven by two or something, microtubules, right? So in these chemotherapy neuropathies, it makes sense if you're disrupting microtubules and you're having trouble getting things down the axon, the longest ones would suffer it the most. So the axonal neuropathies, you might say, well, longest, aren't the legs the longest and then the arms are the next longest? Yes, but if you put your hip and shoulder next to each other, your leg is still longer than your arm, right? So usually a length dependent axonal pattern of neuropathy, the patients will start with symptoms in their feet and the hands won't be affected until um, the legs are affected up to about the shin or the calf. And these axonal neuropathies in general are most commonly due to toxic um, and metabolic causes, diabetes, B12 deficiency, um, et cetera. There are axonal variants of Guillain-Barre. There are axonal um, uh, variants of Charcot-Marie Tooth. But in general, when I hear axonal, toxic metabolic are top of my list. Now, what about demyelinating? So demyelinating um, neuropathies, right, are problems with the myelin rather than with the axons. So the way I think about this is, remember when you're a kid and you you go up against the wall or something and someone draws around you with chalk or you go on a paper and someone draws around you with a marker and then you color and you make a picture of yourself, right? So you have this drawing of yourself and a process affecting myelin is affecting all the myelin. So now imagine you just take a can of paint and throw it against 
that drawing of yourself, right? The paint will go everywhere. So small neurons will be demyelinated, large neurons will be demyelinated, but the longest neurons still have the most myelin, right? So these demyelinating neuropathies um, are non-length dependent as opposed to length dependent axonal. Non-length depending meaning short and long nerve fibers being affected together from the beginning. Now, again, longer fibers still have a higher probability of getting affected because they have more myelin to affect. So you may still see some um, distal predominance. You may still see the legs more involved than the arms, but at presentation, the upper and lower extremities will be affected together. The reflexes will be lost um, throughout rather than just um, distally. So this history suggests a non-length dependent pattern, right? Because the hands were affected first. So that suggests more likely a demyelinating neuropathy than an axonal neuropathy, if, um, if we understood the history correctly from the patient, right? And so, whereas I said the length dependent pattern making you think axonal, you're thinking things like diabetes, B12 deficiency, chemotherapy, toxic metabolic, although there are other things. On the demyelinating side, many of the causes there are inflammatory. So Guillain-Barre, although as we said, it also has axonal um, variants, um, CIDP, um, which is the chronic cousin of Guillain-Barre, this had inflammatory demyelinating neuropathy. But again, um, there, are, there are infections on both sides, there are inflammatory conditions on both sides, there are drugs on both sides, there is genetic on both sides. But as a first pass, this axonal versus demyelinating, very important distinction and it starts to lead us down potential um, pathway. So if we're correct that this is a non-length dependent neuropathy affecting the hands and feet, but it's affecting the hands first and um, it's the sensory problems causing the frequent falls, um, we could be talking about a non-length dependent um, peripheral neuropathy, demyelinating neuropathy, um, or less common is a ganglionopathy where the dorsal root ganglia are affected and that has its own unique differential diagnosis of, you can also get inflammatory, uh, you can see it in Sjogren's, B6 toxicity rather than deficiency, chemotherapy, HIV, and I think can be um, idiopathic. Those are, I've seen maybe two of those called sensory neuronopathy or sensory ganglionopathy, very uncommon. But if we say that this is a demyelinating polyneuropathy or ganglionopathy, um, and then we have a time course here that this has been going on for months, um, what does that time course tell us in terms of possible etiology of this presumed demyelinating neuropathy? What does that time course tell us as far as potential etiology? Well, um, if it was, if it's a demyelinating acute uh, polyneuropathy, I will, neuropathy, I would think the first thought would be Guillain-Barre. If it was chronic, I will definitely think in something in, to in a toxin, maybe in a charcuterie tooth or even ure uremic uh, polyneuropathy, but, but it depends. And I also would like to see um, how are the, like the reflexes, if there is also uh, abnormal uh, vibration, pain or temperature proposition issues, but that's how I will uh, think about the diagnosis, like if it's acute, I will definitely go for Guillain-Barre, like I, for some reason. Yes, and, yeah, for good yeah. reason, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, so this would be a little slow for Guillain-Barre months, right? Usually Guillain-Barre is evolving over days and hits its nadir of worse symptoms, signs in about two to four weeks, and then very prolonged recovery, um, even with treatment. So as I agree with you, too slow for that, we're sort of in the subacute time course here, right? It's not quite chronic enough to make us think of Charcot-Marie tooth, um, which is usually years and years and years of, of subtle um, or years and years and years of progressive um, neuropathy that can be subtle at the beginning. But this is cooking along over um, months or two months only. So I would call this subacute. I think that would make us think more about inflammatory, as you said, toxic metabolic causes. Um, B12 deficiency is subacute combined degeneration, right? It can move along quite um, quickly, but um, that would cause an axonal pattern. And at least from what we're hearing on the history, I'm thinking this is more demyelinating. So I'm sure Rafa is getting nervous that we have 20 minutes left and he has seven aliquots for us. But, um, you know, I like to spend a lot of time seeing how far we can get. And if there's a surprise here that the patient has now had a bone marrow transplant and um, um, has a family history of whatever, um, we'll be in trouble. But I hope I, I hope I um, hedged my bets in, in time management <laughs> appropriately. And if not, we'll We'll speed up. 
Okay, um, so that's where we are. We think this is a subacute demyelinating neuropathy, um, which um, would make me think of inflammatory conditions like CIDP, um, perineoplastic uh, conditions. Um, and based on the presumed demyelinating pattern, a little less likely that I would think of toxic metabolic, but by time course, um, that would be in the differential. Okay, what happened next, Rafa? Okay, so uh, this patient has diabetes type 2, well controlled with diet. This patient also has hyper hyperlipidemia and osteoporosis. When it comes to medications, she's on hydrochlorothiazide, lisinopril, atorvastatin, and she has been on parental by for the past two years. Family history, social history, health related behaviors, and allergies are all unremarkable. And I'm going to give you the physical exam as well. So, Maria, I'm going to need your help here. <laughs> okay, so the patient had a normal cardiac and pulmonary exam. And when it comes to the neuro exam, cranial nerves from 2, uh, two to 12 are intact. This patient has a strength five out of five in large muscle groups of the upper and lower extremities bilaterally, five out of five. Uh, bilaterally, yes. Uh, this patient also has a strength of the dorsal inter OCI, four out of five bilaterally. The strength of the abductor pollicis brevis, three out of five bilaterally. Abductor pollicis. The strength of the iliopsoas, four out of five bilaterally as well. The strength of the tibialis anterior, four out of five bilaterally. The strength of the toe extensors and flexors, four out of five bilaterally. bilaterally. Uh, this patient also has absent deep tender reflexes in biceps, patella, and oculus tendons bilaterally. This patient also has trace triceps deep tendon reflexes, absent, absent uh, let's see, deep tendon reflexes in biceps, patella, and oculus, and, and the Achilles. I don't know if I'm pronouncing correctly. Uh, the tendon of the ankle. Yeah, Achilles, yes. yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, she, this patient also has decreased sensation in fingers and toes. This patient also has decreased proprioception, but normal finger to, to nose and no ataxia. And that's the end of the aliquot. Okay, um, I think we're back to you, Alice. So what do you make of this physical exam? Have we been on the right track in our discussion? Have we been on the wrong track or have we been on partially the right track and we need to um, add another track or none of the above? I think we've been on the right track. I Tell would us say, why. I would say um, the sensory, the sensation is um, in with it and also the motor, um, motor nerves as well. Um, I, I don't really know what I make of this like distribution of the uh, weakness. I'm not, I'm not sure. I keep forgetting which nerves uh, do what, but for me, it sounds like it's a more global problem and not just individual nerves. Um, yeah, I don't know if this would be more acute. Yeah, again, I would be thinking about Guillaume Barré, especially with the like, uh, missing reflexes. That's something I um, always remember. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. I'm not sure if um, CIDP is presenting this way, also with like loss of uh, reflexes. So yeah, that would be something I'm thinking about. I also thought about um, antibody-mediated uh, disease. I was thinking about the perineoplastic. You know, it's just a guess. Um, I think I remember that anti-WHO antibodies can do that. Yeah, so maybe she has... And if I'm correct again, I don't know, um, like some sort of, sort of um, 
gynecological um, tumor. I don't know. I don't know. Is that correct? Ante who? And maybe breast cancer. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, that's something that came to mind. Yeah. Um, excellent um, discussion, Alice. So, right. So up to this point, we knew that sensation was affected and it was affected distally from the history and what we learned here, which was not a totally apparent from the history is that there's also weakness. And as you said, this is um, pretty global weakness. It seems to be more distal than proximal um, is really the only thing we have here. So we have distal sensory and motor deficits and we have reflexia, right? So that confirms we're in the periphery and other um, localizations we entertained. Could this be radiculopathy? We said usually that's um, painful and this would have to be a polyradiculopathy, diffuse polyradiculopathy, um, right? But um, it's not just the dorsal roots, right? Because we have motor. Could this be a sensory ganglionopathy, which I didn't learn about till I was um, far along in residency, but it's a very interesting condition. No, those just the dorsal um, ganglia, dorsal root ganglia, right? We wouldn't have motor deficits. And here we have motor and sensory distal and reflex loss. So I think we're confirmed in our localization in the um, peripheral nerves. And if the history, um, we can rely on it, that really the hands were first, I would still argue this sounds like a demyelinating neuropathy. If the patient wasn't really clear and this is moving along so quickly and all the reflexes are already gone, we we wouldn't really be able to say axonal versus um, demyelinating, but this seems sort of um, equally severe in the arms and legs in a short um, period. So either it would be a very rapidly progressing axonal process or um, a demyelinating process, because as we said, the demyelination is, um, is affecting all of the nerves sort of uh, simultaneously affecting their myelin. And we could get short and long nerves. We could get upper and lower extremities together. Although, as we said, the longest nerves still have the most myelin, so it could still look like this um, distal predominant pattern. But if we believe that the hands were first, this still suggests demyelinating. And so what could be causing that over this time course? This could be a first presentation of, of uh, CIDP, as you mentioned, chronic immune demyelinating polyradiculo neuropathy. It's sort of the chronic cousin of Guillain-Barre syndrome. It has all sorts of pure sensory and pure motor um, variants and then um, sensory motor as well. Um, and could this be perineoplastic? As you said, this woman's a 72. She's at an age where she could be developing cancer. Um, Anti-Hue can do this. Anti-Hue, so well, we don't have enough time probably to get into perineoplastic neurology, but there are some antibodies that have a very particular syndrome uh, every time, like NMDA receptor encephalitis, um, and are associated with a very particular tumor, usually teratoma, though you can, ovarian teratoma, though you can have it without. There are others like anti-HU that are associated with multiple cancers and can be associated with multiple um, syndromes. And anti-HU is one of those, I believe, can be seen with lung, with breast, with many cancers and can cause a neuropathy or a ganglionopathy. I think it can cause, um, I think it can cause uh, a myelopathy as well. I'm not 100% sure, but it can cause many different um, neurologic syndromes. So I think that's possible as well. So um, as a first pass, if we were just seeing a garden variety um, usual uh, distal uh, sensory or distal sensory motor neuropathy, does anyone know what the first laboratory test to send are? So there's actually, I think it's a 2010 um, paper from the American Academy of Neurology that looks at the evidence for which tests people usually send when they see a peripheral neuropathy. What are the highest yield lab tests that are recommended to send? A little different here since we have a rapidly progressive sensory motor neuropathy that sounds demyelinating. So we'll talk about that, but just for teaching purposes, what are the three, it's three tests they recommend or testing three for three things um, uh, for patients with neuropathy. Do you, do you know Alice, um, Yasmin? As the sort of first pass with no, um, there are no particular suspicions or risk factors. I think, um, so axonal patterns as well. Or yeah. So I, yeah, in general, blood. you think the patient has a peripheral neuropathy, right? What what tests would you send? Um, glucose or HbA one C. Um, yep. Definitely. And I think B twelve as well. Yep, those are two. And then the third one is the one people generally have difficulty um, either knowing, Maybe remembering, or guessing. Some sort of parameter that shows that you chronically drink alcohol. Um, good thought, since alcohol can cause a chronic neuropathy. Um, uh, not quite. I see lots of um, 
Good uh, thoughts in the chat, although no one has gotten it quite right yet. So some tests for diabetes, some tests for B12 defi deficiency, usually vitamin B12 level and MMA for diabetes can be fasting serum glucose or hemoglobin A1C um, or glucose tolerance test. Um, again, those would cause an axonal pattern in general, so it doesn't fit with this case, but does anyone know what the third test is? It is not TSH, although people commonly send TSH. What else do people say here? It's not HIV, though if the patient had risk factors for HIV, sure, you would wanna uh, look for HIV. And if you don't get the answer on the first pass, that's part of the second pass. Thiamine is a, is a good thought, although also not the recommended test B6. Um, so the answer is actually SPEP with immunofixation. So diabetes, look for diabetes, send a B12, and look for, and send an SPEP with immunofixation. Why? Because it's a whole, be a whole lecture on um, paraprotein associated neuropathies from multiple myeloma, from MGUS, from Waldenstrom's, from poems, from amyloidosis, um, et cetera. So those paraproteins, um, so, so I should say this, for the years and years I've been practicing neurology and sending B12, A1C, and SPEP, I think it's once, one of my residents once in all of these years picked up a myeloma that was diagnosed because the patient presented with neuropathy and the SPEP came back positive. It's in my experience, not usually the answer, but presumably something you wouldn't want to miss. And the patients with myeloma who I've seen with neuropathy, generally the myeloma is known and they're being referred to me for evaluation and treatment of their neuropathy. Is it the myeloma? Is it their bortezomib, which can cause a neuropathy, um, et cetera. So, um, that is a reminder to us that this could be some paraprotein associated neuropathy. And I think some of those are demyelinating and some of them are axonal. So again, this sounds demyelinating, but probably just common things being common and history is not always being clear. We would send B12, we would send um, A1C, we would send an SPEP. Um, and what else would we do? If nothing is coming back with that, people generally expand to include a rheumatologic panel since um, rheumatologic disease can cause or present with neuropathy. So things like lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, sarcoidosis, et cetera, we could look for those. We could look for HIV. Um, people generally send TSH, syphilis, and those don't tend to, thyroid disease and syphilis don't tend to cause uh, neuropathy. And if we're really striking out and this patient is progressing um, quickly, what other tests could we consider here to try to make a diagnosis if we don't make it based on serum tests? Trying to get a lot of this on the table, Rafa, in case you had four more aliquots, we'll cover some of them in this part of the discussion. So what other tests might you think of? Let's say we've sent our big lab workup, SPEP, hemoglobin A1C, B12, rheumatologic panel, HIV, um, TSH, Lyme, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and we've got nothing. What might we order? Uh, well, if, if we're trying to see if this is a CIDP or a AIDP, I will first ask for an electroneuropathy uh, for signs of demyelination, a CNS analysis for albumin acetologic uh, dissociation, and autoantibodies because autoantibodies against um, nodal uh, proteins are specific to CIDP and anti-GM1, although it's not very specific to, to CIDP, but I will ask for those. And yeah. if it's like inconclusive and nerve ultrasound or nerve biopsy or MRI of spinal nerve roots. Yeah, excellent, right? So EMG nerve conduction studies, particularly the nerve conduction studies, right? Can tell us, is this axonal or demyelinating? Because when you have axonal loss, so you're looking at, many, you can look at many things with EMG nerve conduction studies, but EMG nerve conduction 101, right, as you're looking at amplitude and velocity. And remember, myelin is there to make these nodes of Ranvier to increase the speed of neural transmission. If you have a demyelinating process, you'll see decreased velocities. And if you have preserved myelin, but axonal loss, you'll see decreased amplitude because there's fewer firing nerves to make the amplitude uh, of the signal, right? Now, these get a little bit messy because if you have demyelination of not every nerve fiber, but some of them, you get what's called temporal dispersion in that and the amplitude can be a little bit off. If you have severe enough demyelination that you expose the axons, they can be injured as well. So these get a little bit messy, but in general, we could look for if the velocity is more impaired or the amplitude. Um, and we can look if both short and long nerves are affected, suggesting again, a non-length dependent process. So that could be helpful to us to see which path we're on and, and sort of further our workup. You're right, if there's any suspicion 
This could be CIDP, or it's a little slow, as we said, for AIDP. A lumbar puncture to look for inflammation would be helpful. And you might say, wait, the peripheral nerves are in the periphery. Why are we seeing central inflammation? Well, remember CIDP, the P is polyridiculo neuropathy, and the roots do go through the CSF space. So the inflammation from, and guillain barre the AIDP, the P is polyridiculo neuropathy. If you ever wondered, why do you have CSF inflammation in a peripheral process? It's the roots. So um, we would look at a lumbar puncture, and if um, we could send antibody panels. There is a growing number, as Yasmin said, of these sort of antinodal proteins that are involved in these uh, inflammatory neuropathies. Um, and if we are really um, can't find anything, we could um, we could go looking uh, with nerve biopsy, right, and take a um, piece of nerve. If the patient's already numb in that area, they might not notice even the deficit, and then look at the nerve fibers under the microscope and special stains, et cetera, and see if we can make diagnosis. So I'm going to guess that this patient got labs and this patient got EMG nerve conduction studies. And um, what's what, and well, we'll see where we are after that. And then we'll see if Rafa is going to give us one final aliquot. And we'll, before that, we'll try to wager our final diagnosis. Okay, I'll divide that into two aliquots. Um... So this is the, uh, before the last one. CBC and CMP and creatinine kinase were all within normal range. The CBC, CMP and creatinine kinase. The TSH and the B12 were unremarkable. This patient also had an antimyelin associated glycoprotein antibody negative. And this patient also had an SPEP, and it was negative as well. And the final uh, thing I'm going to tell you is about CT scan. The CT scan of the head showed no acute abnormalities, and the CT of the chest showed no masses or nodules. And that's the end of the aliquot. I have just one more that will reveal the diagnosis. Okay, so I guess our questions are: What test revealed the final diagnosis, and what do you think the final? diagnosis was. What do we think, Alice, Yasmin? And I'm not sure I know the answer to this, but we'll see what we can come up with. What tests do you think we've done? Um, serum tests. We've done some imaging of the chest, presumably to look for um, cancer or some other systemic clue as to why the patient has a neuropathy? Well, maybe as you said, if everything like B12 is, is normal, there is no autoantibodies, um, I will definitely go to see the, uh, the monoclonal gammopathies. Maybe that will be the, the third, like our last thing to check. Yeah, it looks like he did have an SPEP. I know that. Oh. I'm sorry, I didn't read we have it. so many teaching yeah. points that writing is getting small. Yeah, but yeah, the okay. SPEP was normal there. Yeah. I think if you're done with the blood works, I would think they performed a biopsy. And yeah, was it a, a nerve biopsy? Yeah. Um, could be. So I guess probably, you know, before being so invasive, we would do the EMG nerve conduction and make sure we're really talking about a demyelinating neuropathy. And if we are, um, I would probably be, well, this is a couple of tests, getting a spinal tap to see if this could be um, CIDP, uh, something in the family of CIDP. Um, to me, it's too fast for genetic etiology. You might say so late to present with genetic etiology. It does happen, um, but this is, this is moving along too quickly. So I still want to call this a um, demyelinating neuropathy, and at this pace, I'm still sort of anchored on CIDP, and so wondering if the patient got spinal tap was showing some inflammation, but no infectious etiology. Um, what else could we be missing here that we haven't thought of? Um, we didn't hear about any skin findings to suggest leprosy. Usually that causes a mononeuropathy, a multiplex, and I wouldn't expect it to be running along this quickly. Yeah, I think I'm stuck on inflammatory neuropathies, particularly uh, CIDP, but Rafa always has surprises for us. So let's see what we learn. No, don't worry. I'm not a big, just like Valley uh, 
if in, in the end it's like TB. Don't worry about that. <laughs> TB neuropathy, that would be a new one for me unless it's on <laughs> ice and eyes it and you forgot to tell us. Yeah. No, no, don't worry. I'm not uh, hiding any information. Uh, the final test that I'm going to reveal to you all is a, the nerve conduction studies. And it showed a demyelinating sensory motor polyneuropathy with notable prolonged distal motor latencies. And that's the end of the case. And I'm going to reveal the diagnosis. Okay, so um, so you want us to interpret the EMG and then then we get the final diagnosis. Okay, very good. Yeah. Um, so Alice, Yasmin, how does the EMG nerve conduction study? This is the nerve conduction study part. Um, technically, the EMG is the needle study of the muscles, but um, how does this help us? If I'm not wrong, that uh, the prolonged distal motor latencies are also seen in ALS, No. Also, what? I'm sorry. Are seen in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, the so, pr so, prolonged distal so, motor latencies. So ALS is, um, is an axonal uh, process. Yeah. The motor neurons are dying. So usually you'll see uh, axonal loss, decreased amplitudes with, with preserved, you should have mm -hmm. preserved velocity in that case. Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm also stuck with CIPD, honestly. Like, yeah. Um, any thoughts, Alice, on this EMG? And then I have maybe one more thought based on it but um i'm just thinking that the nerve conduction itself is not proving any diagnosis right it's just saying that we are uh, we were right thinking that this might be demyelinating so it would fit a crdp but it's not proving anything yeah 100 percent agree with you right that as good neurologists right we already knew it was a demyelinating neuropathy from the history right and we just confirmed it on the exam and the emg nerve conduction is sort of an extension of the physical exam um so, so I'm still on CIDP and CIDP has a number of variants. And the only thing we might add here is we sort of saw this from the history that there was a distal predominance and there is a, a CIDP variant called DADS, distal acquired demyelinating sensory, is it sensory or sensory motor? It might just be sensory. So this is motor and I might be off. And that's important to know that variant. I think it's just sensory. I've only had one case, because I think it's associated with an anti-mag IgM, but we didn't see anything on the SPEP, although one important thing when you work these patients up is um, the SPEP alone is not adequate. You need to get immunofixation with it because you can sometimes miss um, monoclonal protein with the SPEP alone. Um, so is this the distal variant of CIDP? I thought the DADS one was, was pure sensory, but um, we're starting to split hairs, and I think I would still say um, with this demyelinating neuropathy and this pace, I'd want to do a lumbar puncture and, and see if the CSF is inflammatory. And if so, I would feel comfortable um, calling the CIDP and, and treating it as such. Um, so what happened next, Rafa, in our final moments here? Oh, you guys are, oh, you guys are all right all along. So this patient was eventually diagnosed with CIDP and you, she was initially treated with IVIG without improvement and continued to have slow progression of weakness. She was then treated with high dose steroids with no significant improvement, but no progression of symptoms. And she did develop a hyperglycemia on the steroids. And currently, uh, they're considering ongoing treatment with steroids versus rituximab. And that's the end of the case. Incredible job. Yeah, great case, Rafa. So, right. So, this is inflammatory disease. and. Um, it's rare enough that I'm not sure there are comparative trials, right? But steroids, either daily or pulsed, um, IVIG, um, monthly, or depending how often the patient needs it, plasma exchange or tuximab, I think are all um, are all fair game, but not necessarily um, evidence based. CIDP is frequently misdiagnosed. Actually, there's a whole literature on you know um, misdiagnosis of CIDP. There are criteria I think that were recently um, updated and um, relies heavily on some, some EMG nerve conduction study parameters. But patients, for example, with diffuse pain syndromes will sometimes be told they have CIDP based on some equivocal EMG finding, and they go down this path of getting immunosuppression, which is um, not the appropriate treatment in those cases. So um, I, I can't say I've seen too many cases of CIDP in um, real life. Um, and I don't know if that's because they all find their way directly to neuromuscular specialists, and I'm a general neurologist, or it's just not all that common. I'm not sure the prevalence, but um, it's out there. 
And this is the type of patient whom you would consider it a relatively rapidly progressive, but slower than Guillain-Barre um, uh, pr presentation of a, of a non-lent dependent uh, neuropathy. And probably if you wanted to be really solid on the diagnosis here, maybe this happened, you just didn't tell us, Rafa, you would, you would do a lumbar puncture to prove that there is some inflammation there. And without that, I think you'd, I'd have to look at the criteria, but I think you'd be hard pressed to, to, um, to call this CIDP. Um, without documenting some inflammation. Thank you, Rafa. No, did you have some teaching points on this case, Rafa? You're already telling us one per 100,000. Uh, did you have other things you wanted to tell us about this case, Rafa, or CIDP? You feel free. No, no, no. It's just you're uh, telling us that you're not sure about the prevalence of the disease. And you're so sure the, about it. <laughs> yeah, the prevalence about one, from one to nine cases per 100,000. Interesting. Um, so it's out there and maybe the places I've worked is just getting directly referred to neuromuscular. Well, great um, discussion, everyone. I know we're a little bit um, over time, um, but we started around 9.07, so I'll call it still within fair game for neuro um, VMR. I think a case that shows um, the power of that history, right? And really um, understanding which what happens when, first, second, here are the hands before the feet and the exam. And then when we think about peripheral neuropathies, um, as I said, many ways to classify is it sensory, sensory motor or motor or autonomic? Is it large fiber or small fiber? Um, but this demyelinating versus axonal or non lent dependent versus lent dependent is very powerful um, history and exam um, way of classifying things that then gives us initial clues into the differential diagnosis. And in this case, kind of took us right to non lent dependent demyelinating subacute, um, making us think of CIDP. Excellent. Um, Maria, I see you've been. Um, making the teaching points box larger and larger. Would you like to tell us uh, some of the highlights from there before we wrap up? It wouldn't be NeuroVMR without like half of the, the whiteboard being teaching points, but I'm really happy Rafa presented this case. Uh, CIDP was like the diagnosis that made me think, huh, neuro is actually pretty interesting. <laughs> so we started with freak and falls and um, we sort of uh, analyzed gait. Uh, I like this quote about something that gait is sort of the symphony of all of the other nervous system components because uh, it really requires a lot of afferents. I had written input at first, but then I remembered there's like a nice newer word for input. So let's go with afferents, um, which involves all of the sen sensory inputs, uh, visual inputs, proprioception. Uh, you really need that component to sort of be able to stand and walk. And then we need the integration part um, that happens to in the motor cortex, basal ganglia, cerebellum, and the afferents, which is all of the tracts, nerves, and muscles, and re that requires the strength and like the motor component that we usually think about when we talk about gait. Um, we sort of jumped into it, but then Alice was like, what if this is not frequent falls, but it's actually syncope? So we also talked about how that could all how, how that could be explained by autonomic dysfunction or polypharmacies. Um, and then whenever you see falls, try to see whatever else catches your attention. So in this case, what ca caught our attention was the numbness of the fingers. So we started talking about the sensory aspect of neuro, <laughs> how it involves things from you know the nerves, which caught catch this, um, I don't know, catch everything sensory. <laughs> and those, they, they transmit it to the nerve roots, spinal tracts, cortex. This is very simplified, but there's like a million steps in between these big uh, landscapes. Um, so how to narrow it to neuropathy? We always try to localize lesion to a single like, not CNS, but like nervous structure. Um, and, you know, we want one thing that describes everything. So we, that made, it rule, made us rule out cortex that needs multiple uh, lesions to cause, you know, abnormalities in fingers and toes. Uh, the spinal tracts usually have other signs such as bowel and bladder involvement, nerve roots are usually painful. So we started localizing to nerves. Uh, we're very eager to call out like all of the etiologies of a neuropathy, but they can be infectious metabolic toxins, um, hereditary inflammatory. I think I said them twice, but um, you know, you get the, the overall um, picture that almost anything can cause a neuropathy. So we really need to start being a little bit more systematic. So the first branching point, you can try to think about the components that it involves, such as motor versus sensory neuropathies, or the fibers that involve, such as large or small fibers. 
but we went with the branching point of axonal versus the myelinating. The myelinating. So axonal, um, you know, the tendon is that longer axons are affected first. So they're what we call length dependent neuropathies. Uh, these usually involve legs before arms and are generally caused by toxic and, and met metabolic etiologies versus the demyelinating where we have myelin everywhere. So the affection can really be caused anywhere. Um, and this can be confusing as long nerves also have the most myelin. But in this case, as Aaron said, it was really important to know that hands were affected before feet. So that made us think about demyelinating more than axonal. And then we started thinking the, about the time components. So when it's acute, this would be GBS until proven otherwise. But with chronic, we get other causes that we need to think about, such as perineal plastic, metabolic toxin, hereditary, and, and inflammatory. The first pass for all patients would involve an HbA1c, vitamin B12, and SPET. Um, the second pass would involve room and HIV. And whenever everything comes back <laughs> negative, we tend to think about CIDP, which is um, the, the which is chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. So it pretty much describes what it is. Um, it's commonly misdiagnosed as GBS because it can it's a bit slower to involve to progress, but it also progresses fairly quickly. And things like the numbness of fingers can be uh, not even described by the patient. So they might have like the numbness of fingers um, for weeks, but then what they really notice is the frequent falls or that suddenly progress fairly more quickly. Um, so that was the final diagnosis. Uh, more common than I thought <laughs> also. Um, but yeah, interesting case. And thank you, Rafa, for bringing it. It brings back memories. The first time I tried to learn about neurology after like my classes was me sitting in like a, in like a, <laughs> in like a, in a coffee shop and me like opening the, the neuro book for like polyneuropathies. And then I read like a paragraph and I was like, no, this is too complicated. So I closed it. <laughs> I'm glad that a couple of years later we're discussing it. Fantastic. Thank you, Maria. And thanks, Rafa, for bringing this case. I think Rafa has moved on to other things. <laughs> Thank you, um, Yasmin and Alice, for the excellent discussion. And thanks, Maria, for summarizing the teaching points. And hope you all have a nice day. See you next week.